see if this works. Oh, look at that. Great. Thank you so much, Anne. Uh, Anna. It's really brilliant to be here and be back at Rubicon. I'm really excited about it. And I was so grateful to, to sit in on Scott's first session, which is actually so relevant to a lot of what I got to say. I won't comment on it now, but I hope it will become evident as I go through. I've been asked uh, to look at the conversation that we're having today in the Irish context. And when it comes to the treatment of women in modern Irish history, it's very disturbing. Magdalene laundries, mother and baby homes, domestic violence, more recently the In Her Shoes website, highlights story after story of misogyny, abuse, trauma and violence. In the, recent, in the run-up to the recent referendum, the rhetoric became increasingly polarised, with some pointing the finger of blame at the church, rightly so, in the, with the tomb baby scandal on the, on the horizon. Others, including some within the church, launched attacks on feminism and rigorously rejected suggestions of male privilege. And it was this, in this context that some conversations I was having with a number of people came into sharp focus. We were asking, is Christianity good news for women? We were asking, what is the experience of women in Irish churches? Are Christian men any different to the men outside the church? And how prevalent is the theology that limits the role of women within our churches? We asked, are we all one in Christ, as Paul said in Galatians 3.28, or are some more equal than others? If you'll bear with me today, I'm struggling with a chest infection this week, so it's quite a challenge. We, we launched, decided to launch a new Vox survey in partnership with YWCI Ireland, which was a great collaboration, to explore the role and experience of women in the Irish church and attitudes towards women. With the Me Too movement and Church Too movement gaining traction, we decided it was essential to include questions around rape culture, violence and abuse in our survey. We launched in July and ran for one month online and gathered during that time 800 responses or just over 800 responses from all over the island, from all four provinces, from every major Christian denomination and type of church on the island. And I can pretty much stand by that. They're, they're pretty much everybody is represented. With a wide cross-section of ages and backgrounds, we were able to gather a great diversity of views and perspectives, some diametrically opposite to one another. And we are to date still analyzing the reams of data we gathered. One um, point to mention, around 5% of our respondents came from ethnic minority communities. And some of them felt the questions didn't satisfactorily answer the issues that they are facing. So I feel that we have a lot more to learn from the ethnic minority communities and their experiences. In the recent Vox magazine, and if you haven't seen it, we do have copies available here today, we published the headline findings of our research. And we're hoping to publish a much more detailed report at a later date. So in the light of all of this, the, the breadth and the depth of the data that we've gathered, I hope you'll bear with me today as I can only raise a few issues and highlight a few of the key themes that have emerged. In terms of the theology around women in the church, Christians tend to adhere to one of two main positions. Complementarianism, which is the belief that men and women have different roles in the church and that women should not teach or take authority over a man. Egalitarianism looks at the equality of men and women in the church 
and sees that God calls men, both men and women into all roles. In our survey, we found quite surprisingly that complementarianism was in a very significant minority, although the men only in a survey would have been 24%, whereas as you can see, the, the whole survey was 15%. But egalitarian position hugely in the majority of our survey. But interestingly enough, when you actually look at the main ministries within our churches, they still are, tend to be led in gender-specific ways. So, for example, preaching, teaching, Bible teaching, uh, and obviously overall church leadership is still predominantly male. You see the green on the pie there. Uh, ministries such as hospitality and children's work was predominantly women. Who put pink on there? <laughs> And, and interesting enough, worship and pastoral care are much more equally balanced. Now, oops, <laughs> sorry, I, I, I went too fast, but that was a, a, a quote that we had from one woman who was in a leadership training session. She was told hell would freeze before she would be asked to preach or teach on a Sunday. Um, now, I, I would, you would expect that complementarian churches would, um, would have specific roles that they wouldn't want women to, to play. Uh, but my question was, why in egalitarian churches do they still have very gender-specific roles? Um, it seems that in those churches, which are, according to our survey, in the predominance they don't actually live what they say they believe. One of the standout findings of our survey, and I think it's very important to mention, is that the majority of women feel valued by their church and feel content in the contribution that they make to church life. 60% con content in their contribution and around 73% feel valued by their church. Women have found welcome, belonging and support in their church community. And many say they love the church they attend. That's quite important to, to note, the church they attend many women reported having to change church to find their church home. Even negative experiences were often explained as living in a perfect world, imperfect world. I like this quote. I have only ever been encouraged and included in church leadership and teaching. I have never felt excluded or undermined because of my gender, one woman said. That's good news. Unfortunately, there is a very significant number of women in our survey who shared story after story, experience after experience of sexism, exclusion, and disrespect that they have experienced in the church. These include jokes, personal comments, pats on the head, and blatant objectification. I found this quite heartbreaking. I found men outside of the church who were more respectful towards me and valued me more as a person than in all of my experience growing up in Christian youth culture and as an adult active in a vibrant church. 61% of women reported hearing sexist remarks in church. And one in five, for one in five, this is a regular occurrence for one in five of us. Single women are far more likely than married women to experience a whole range of sexist behaviors in our churches. And a, a small percentage of men and women say they've also heard sexist comments made by women about men. When it comes to feminism, there's considerable concern and confusion about the use of the term. Many women 
who said no, they were not a feminist, still want gender equality, but they didn't like the idea of being associated with feminism. Others who said yes, they are a feminist, were quick to clarify that they weren't talking about militant feminism and they actually didn't want women to advance at the expense of men. Men, however, were much stronger in the comments around feminism. You see, about 40% of men were ex concerned about the rise of feminism, 22% on the fence. I think most that can be added to the 40%. So again, about 62% of men quite concerned about this rise. And that was reflected in comments, some of whom said feminism is anti-Christian, and the raised concerns about man-hating and also the idea that, um, of this positive discrimination. Nothing positive about positive discrimination, one of them said. Having said that, I, I was impressed by some of the women. I'm pro-women, one woman said, but I'm pro-men as well. And another said, I don't know if I've got it on there, no. <laughs> Another commented, I would like to see the church celebrate and develop all the gifts that God has given to both women and men. This quote at the bottom expresses a deep concern for some of the men. Boys exposed to extreme feminist rhetoric are left without a positive view of what they can become as a man, he said. I think this ex expresses one of the challenges that has emerged, emerged from our findings. We really need in churches to find the environment where we can discuss these deeply felt concerns without either side becoming threatened or defensive. We need to really learn to listen respectfully and attentively to one another without dismissing painful experiences or genuine fears. And we need to work to make our churches into safe places where women and men are valued and free to flourish. When looking at the wider society, there seemed a lot of confusion among Christians about the causes of gender-based violence and sexual assault. Condemning rape and sexual violence, yet often unaware of the systems underlying and the attitudes which contribute to the abuse of women. We asked, is there a rape culture in Ireland? The women said yes. The men said no, although it was pretty close. In the comments section, it became obvious that this is a, an emotive and provocative question. 10% wanted a don't know option. Many were unhappy with our definition of rape culture as a society in which sexual violence is normalized and excused in the media and popular culture but others pointed to the Belfast rape trial and the Cork High School rape list as examples of that very culture at work here. 58% of women and 72% of men felt that the way a woman dresses influences or sometimes influences rape and sexual assault. There was a lot of comments saying it's not an excuse and that clothing doesn't justify assault, but also comments saying that a woman is inviting attention by the way she dresses. Similarly, drinking, taking drugs, and going to a party was considered to impair judgment and clarity of content, consent in the case of rape. And again, while not an excuse, some suggested that women are knowingly putting themselves at risk. We asked about the film Fifty Shades of Grey. We asked, does this film empower women and young girls? And the answer was a resounding no, as you would hope and expect. But very few could articulate a well-reasoned answer and response. They would often say, I never watched it, 
One even asked, why is this question even in a Christian survey? <laughs> it seemed that condemning the film as sinful and disgusting took precedence over finding compelling answers to a manipulative and abusive relationship that romanticizes sexual violence against a woman. So in all this confusion, one quote for me really cut through the pack. It was a quote from a man, I've no idea who it is, maybe he's in this room. <laughs> I think the discussion needs to move away from what women do and have done in this context and start addressing the problem with men. Why do men behave in this way? Very poignant. But as, as important as those discussions around rape culture and our wider society are, for me the most disturbing findings of our survey were in terms of abuse within the church. 2% of men and a shocking 9% of women have experienced sexual abuse or sexual harassment in the churches in Ireland. That is one in 15 of those surveyed. Now let's be clear, sexual abuse and sexual harassment are crimes under Irish law. And these crimes, according to our survey, have happened and are happening in every denomination and type of church in Ireland. In addition, 25% of women and 14% of men have experienced sexual abuse or harassment outside the church. That means abuse survivors are sitting in the seats and pews of every faith community on this island. Every faith community. One in three of both men and women have experienced or witnessed domestic violence. And we found that very, very few churches even talk about this issue. One in every two people of our survey, 51% of men and 47% of women have experienced emotional abuse, spiritual abuse or bullying within our churches or Christian ministries. We need to take a long, hard look at the culture and systems in our churches that have allowed people to be harmed in the very place where they sought sanctuary and solace. This is not just an out there problem. It is my church and it's your church too. And it won't go away if we ignore it, minimize it, or try to cover it up. Abuse thrives when we favor reputation, power, and privilege. And that's why I loved what Scott was saying this morning. But followers of Jesus walk in the footsteps of one who laid aside his status, who relinquished his rights, and who gave up his life for our sake. Those of you who know me know that I love to celebrate and honor Christians, individuals, and churches who are doing wonderful things all over this island to bring life and hope and help to their, their communities. I want to give encouragement and inspiration. That's my joy in life. But when it comes to the survey, this survey findings, Although there are glimmers of hope, there is absolutely no place for complacency or apathy. We need to weep with those who weep. Every person abused within our church should be breaking our heart. We need to take notice of injustice, whether inside our church or out. And we need to learn to listen well to the very voices of those who've been disrespected, overlooked and abused, whether they are women or men, young or old, black or white, whoever they are. But you, God, see the trouble of the afflicted. You consider their grief and take it in hand. 
the victims commit themselves to you. We are not yet all one in Christ, but I've not given up hope yet. Thank you.